this is uh, Jay Horowitz with another edition of Amazing Mets Alumni Podcast. My special guest this week is you know, Art Shamsky from the 69 Miracle Mets. Art, you told me a story the other day. You came to the Mets in 68 uh, from the Reds, and the first time you t- told Tom Seaver, I guess the year before you had hit a three-run homer against him. What, what did he t- what say to you? Yeah, I faced Tom in 67 when I was with the Reds, Jay, and uh, I hit a meaningless three-run home run in the ninth inning at uh, – at Shea Stadium with the Reds when I was there and, and uh, made the score 7-3, and I think that's how the game finished up. And that was his first year in major leagues. And, you know, of course, you knew that uh, he was going to be a pretty good pitcher. I think he won 17 games, if I'm not mistaken. Right, rookie, rookie of the year, year, too. And rookie of the year. And uh, and then when I got traded over um, the next year, uh, I came over and, uh, you know, I didn't really know too many people. I knew Eddie Cranepool. I knew a couple guys I'd played against uh, in the big leagues and maybe in the minor leagues and, and went and said hello to a few guys and then went up and said hello to Seaver and he said uh, he said to me you know uh, I remember you I remember that day in June he had the date down and everything really and he said uh, this will be the last time we talk about that that that, that, that game that we hit home run that was it so we never talked about it again you got you you, did, you were fortunate not to experience the lose a lot of losing you got there in 68 could you sense when he got there in March of 60, could you sense things were turning around or not really? Well, you know, you, when you played against the Mets in those those early years and, uh, you know, they were really not a good team. And if you didn't win two out of three, you know, you thought it was a bad series because, uh, as you mentioned, they were losing 100 games every year, finishing last. But but when I got over to the team, and which was a new experience for me, I'd never been traded before. And, and uh, I, I came the same time that Gil Hodges came as manager. Um, Tommy Ag, Al Weiss, J.C. Martin. A few of us came around the same time, and and even though when I first heard that I, was, I got traded to the Mets, it was a little bit of disappointment. I wasn't crazy about the city of New York. The Mets were a losing team, which all goes to what your question was originally. When I got there, I I, I sensed a, a little bit of a change, and not that I had been there earlier, but when Gil Hodges took over, uh, he was a no-nonsense person. I remember the very first day in spring training. In 68, uh, he said, uh, he had a meeting and he said, I uh, just want everybody to know that you will not be the same old Mets as you were in the past. So that told me right off the bat he was not going to tolerate uh, losing so much and, and poor play. And, and, uh, and I think right away everybody got a sense that uh, things were going to change. And even though in 68 we finished ninth, I believe a half game out of last place, there was only one National League at that point. It, uh, I think everybody got a sense that things were going to change. And, and who knew we were going to win a World Series in, in 1969? But I think everybody felt that uh, they were on the right track with Gil Hodges as manager. Oh, you were one of the few guys who saw Tom. Uh, you went out there to his winery in California. What was it like walking through his house with the trophies and the balls and the winery? You know, I mean, he was a perfectionist with the wine stuff too. What was it like? Just seeing all those things firsthand. Well, I was just in the process of writing uh, the book uh, after the miracle, which was in coincide with the 50th anniversary, and this was 2017. Uh, and and I knew that Tom wasn't traveling anymore because he had just announced that he was, uh, or the family had just announced that he had he was having these problems, uh, these this illness, and that uh, he wasn't going to do any traveling. So we decided to go out there because I didn't want to do an interview with him on the phone. You know, we got there and and we're lucky enough to spend a day with him. I was just amazed at the beauty of well, where he lived and 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 how much he was into this wine business and and the acres that he had for 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 growing grapes and and uh, you know it, it was it was it was kind of a sentimental journey for all of us i took uh, uh, myself and, and, and the three other teammates went with me and we just uh, it was just an incredible time but we we reminisced about about 1969 of course but just sp- spending time with tom and talking about uh, all of the accomplishments that that he did and all the good things that happened to us as a team and and just spending time out there and looking at all his awards and trophies and 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 feeling like we were all part of this wonderful experience in 1969 but it was very special to be out there and see how he was uh, doing this business now with the wine business and 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 making another life for himself but uh, it was bittersweet in a sense because uh, when we said goodbye after spending um, eight or nine hours together on that saturday afternoon out in calistoga it was bittersweet in a sense that 
we we had already lost a number of players on that team, and and now that he had just um, had announced his illness, and there was other guys who were not doing well. You just didn't know if we were going to see all these people again, and so that was a little bittersweet for me. Well, you know, uh, April fifteenth, opening day, we put the, the, the receiver statue goes up. What is that going to mean to you when you see that? Uh, I mean, a symbol of everything, from losers to lovable losers to winners. Just transformed the whole organization. What will it mean to you when you see the Well, he, he, he's really the face of the franchise, and uh, and I'm sure as we go along, there'll be other great players that come along, you know, David Wright, uh, Mike Piazza, and et cetera, et cetera. But Tom was really the, 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 the face that, that really changed the perception of it, and, and along with Gil Hodges, I must say. Gil, Gil was uh, certainly a catalyst in everything we did in that accomplishments in 1969. But Tom, uh, realistically, is, is the, when you talk about the Mets in the early years in 1969. Everybody talks about Tom Seaver, and I think it'll be a tribute. I wish it would have happened years earlier, but uh, who knows? I don't. Howard, I, I just want to touch with some of the guys who are unfortunately not here and tell me what they meant to the team, like Tug McGraw. What were your what's your first impression about Tug? What he meant to the team? Well, Frank, uh, as I call him, Frank McGraw was just very special. Uh, he was the kind of guy that at any moment, at any time, any circumstance, he was able to say anything that was on his mind and uh, he, he was a great teammate, uh, a real character and when uh, he got going he made everybody feel feel important and funny and uh, he was he was great and I just never forget some of the, the banter that went on between him and Jerry Kuzman and some of the guys and Tug passed away way too young. I think he was only 59 when he passed away. We, we get Don Cladet in June that year and I mean people like him to the Keith Hernandez trade the same thing power in the locker room. And he, he was a lawyer, went down to be a lawyer. What was, was he What was he like? In well, he was a lawyer, but I'm not sure I would have had him work on any, even traffic tickets for me, but yeah. I always told him that, and he used to get upset with me because of that, but uh, he was very, very bright, and when he got over to the team, we were all, it really changed the outlook of, of, uh, of, of the team because he was a right-hand power hitter with the head experience and been around and been on some winning teams, and he, he like you said, he was a, he was a lawyer, but he was also um, he was a, a clubhouse lawyer, if you know, in the sense that right. the, uh, there's an old phrase, clubhouse lawyers, and those are guys that know a little bit about everything and, and a lot about nothing. But uh, in, in his case, he knew a lot about everything. He was a very bright guy, and he kept us loose. I mean, he, there was any any. Yeah, I'll give you an example. If you if you if you made an error in a game, say on a, a night game, and or you struck out in a situation, nobody would say anything to you after the game. But the next day, you'd walk in the locker room, and he would be all over you about whatever you did to to, to not yeah. help the team win. Yeah. So he was uh, he was he was quite a character, and uh, um, and you you had to go right back at him. Otherwise, he would just keep getting on you. But but he was uh, he was part of that mix, Jay. That the locker room was was uh, such an incredible group of guys and. And, and Ed Charles was just the opposite. I was going to ask you about Ed Charles. Yeah, Eddie was the kind of guy that if you had a bad game or an 0 for 4, he would come up to you, put his arm around you. And he had been through so many experiences, and not necessarily good experiences, as somebody come, growing up and then trying to get to the big leagues. And he was held back in the big leagues because of the color of his skin. And he was one of these guys that uh, he, he understood emotions, and he would he would – he would make you feel like uh, whatever happened to you, it was a better day tomorrow. And Eddie was 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 really the catalyst. I like to say that that held that locker room together, the clubhouse together, as, with with all the fun guys and the and the craziness that went on. Ed Charles was was the kind of guy that uh, that really kept everything in perspective. And he was the kind of guy that every team needs. I, I really have to say that. And again, he 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 passed away and. Uh, um, so many good memories from from Ed Charles and Don Clendenin and Tug and those I guys. Some of the pictures you didn't have to headline to, you know, Don Cardwell, uh, Cal Coots, and, and Jack Deloro all played big parts, and you don't really hear a lot about them. But yeah, you know, they're not unappreciated by somebody like myself and no, guys. No, but I'm just who I wanted to bring. Yeah, it up, you know? uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. But there's, I think one of the beauties of that '69 team is that when you talk about it. Uh, I, I think anybody who understands the game of baseball knows that how much these guys contributed yeah. to the success of the team. You don't just talk about the greatness of Tom Seaver and Kuzman and Jones and A.G. and, and some of the other guys, but you talk about Al Weiss and you talk about Don Cardwell and Cal Koontz and you talk about Jack DeLauro and you talk about all the guys who helped contributed something to us being successful. And I think that really is the, the true legacy of that team. And I think 
really goes back to the way Gil Hodge is managed. He got everybody involved in the game. He platooned in four or five positions, and while nobody really liked that situation, um, the reality of it was it was helping us win ball games, so we accepted and we had to- so much respect for Gil. Al Weiss once told me a story. He said that he used to, Gil used to get him in here in June and July to prepare for the postseason. He winds up getting uh, the deciding hit in the first game in the series, the second game in the series, right? And he hit a home run in game five. So it's the perfect example about it. Kind of an, an irregular, regular getting a big hit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And and and, and Al was a uh, sudden, a really important part of that team. And uh, again, he's one of those guys that when you talk about it, everybody knows the name Al Weiss. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So all for all of us that. I think that's great to be able to go back and look at some of these guys who, who, uh, who we still have the nucleus around. Thank God for that. But some of these guys who really were part of that team and very important in the success of the team. And I'm, I'm really happy that when we talk about it now, 53 years later, we still talk about these guys who at some point contributed to the success of that '69 Met team. Yeah, unfortunately, hey, one thing I forgot to bring up on the beginning, um, probably is not known by a lot of people. Uh, you went over to, you know, Buddy Harrelson is not well right now. He's at a home in Long Island. But you went over to his house and had to catch with him to try and cheer him up. And, Buddy, tell the people, you know, I mean, not be, it was a really nice thing to do. I know his wife, Kim, asked you to go. And, and how did that come about? Yeah, it's, it's funny. You know, I, I, I'd been meaning to go out and visit with him because I knew that he was really going through a tough time. And it was at home at the time. And, and, and so we arranged with uh, Kim Harrelson to, uh, to, to come out and, and spend some time. And she said, don't, don't be surprised at some of the things that he says. It will, if he doesn't do this or he doesn't do that. So I was pretty much uh, uh, ready for anything. And, uh, and uh, luckily he, he did, uh, she, she said my name and he, he recognized me. And we were talking for a bit and she said, well, why don't you guys go out and have a catch? And um, and actually, I brought my glove because she said he might want to do that, really not knowing seriously if he wanted to do it. And that was such a, an incredible 10, 15 minutes, Jay. I, I can't tell you what a thrill it was for me to be able to, to sit down there outside, went out in his front port, front lawn, and we just kind of soft tossed, maybe 15, 20 feet. And what was interesting about that whole the whole time is that his motor skills were so fine. He, 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 he was going through the beginning stages of Alzheimer's, but he caught the ball, threw it back to me. Right. It was like it was, we were just warming up before a game. And, and for me to be able to do that, and I, I, I tweeted it out, a, a little footage of us doing that. And I must have had, I don't know, I had an incredible response from people who commented about wanting, they were so happy to see him and know that he was still able to do that but but it was interesting that that that, that he just he not he had not lost anything of those motor skills and i i don't know the situation now i'm sure yeah. it's a little bit different but back back then a couple of years ago it was just a, for me to be able to play catch with a teammate and and be able to reminisce with him like that was great i think he's the the, the only guy to have two world series in 69 and 86 he, he's, he's the only he was coach on 86 and I think he's the only one from the Mets, at least. Yeah, yeah and Barry lost out in '73 too. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So more power to him. At, uh, right, was you, a, I know you've written two books. How, how did you get into the writing part of it? Did you something you wanted to do? I mean, it was, well, you know, it's interesting, Jay. I, I wanted to write about that year '69 way back. I remember we did a 25th anniversary celebration in '94. I right. believe it was. And I, and I saw the adulation from fans 25 years later and, and how important that team was to 25 years from the day we won and that whole year. And, of course, that was the year of the baseball strike, and, right. uh, and that was a tough year for, for baseball in general. But I saw the love and admiration from fans, and, and so I said, I think I want to write about that year. And it wasn't only just because of the – the 69 Mets, it was the year the Jets won the Super Bowl in 69 in January that year, and then the Knicks won the NBA championship in um, May of 70. But what was interesting about the three teams is that nobody had ever won before. You know, you talk about those teams, but everybody thinks the Knicks had won before, and of course the Jets had never won before. Right, right. And so I, I, th- I knew there was a story there. So that book, um, uh, Magnificent Seasons, is about the three teams and how they were all right. started and, and how that year happened. And so for me, it was just a labor of love, and I never written before, but I did. I spent hours at the public library doing research, and that was when they had to go look through old film of the papers right, and everything. Right. So for me, Very it was really a sure. yeah, it was really 
a labor of love, and, and the book turned out really nice, and I, I still have it on my website, and people still still want to buy it. And, and, the, and the second book was uh, the, the one about the 50th anniversary um, after the miracle. And what's interesting about that idea, and I wrote it with a gentleman by the name of Eric Sherman, who had written a number of books right, on I the Mets and was a well. big Met fan. And, and so um, he knew Met history, but I wanted to, I realized that over the years, and, and you might be able to, to say this is true or not true, but I think more books have been written about the 69 Mets than any sports team in the yeah, history of sports. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, I, I don't know the number, but there's so many books written about it. So I didn't want to write a book just about, you know, how we won and all the, the same things that have been written before. And so I thought about it, and what was important to me was the relationships that developed from, from us winning that year and have maintained for us over the years. And part of the reason that people still love that team and the relationships are, are so solid is that guys went through some really bad years like Eddie Cranepool and Ron Soboda and Tug McGraw who were there years before we won the World Series and saw all the losing that you mentioned before. And so for me, I think writing about that relationship for guys who who saw the bad and the good, the bad and the ugly with the Mets in those early years and then us winning the World Series was very important. And then talk about how 50 something years later, we still remain friends and brought us so much closer together because we were on some bad teams. And even in 68 was not a good team. We finished ninth that year. So for me, writing about that was very important as opposed to just talking about, you know, this particular game or that particular no, game. And so that's how that book came books. about. I read them both. Uh, them thank both. you. I, well, you getting ready for your, you're getting some warm ups some body practice for old timers that game? Well, here's the thing. I, I, I worked out and stretched my arm a little bit. And, you know, a few years ago when I would do this, I would start on the mound and then work my way now over the years to halfway to the mound. And today, I, I'm not sure, maybe 15, 20 feet, well, maybe underhand. It should be a fun day. We have about 60 uh, former players coming back all the decades. And first time we've done it since 1994. So August 27th should be a good day at City Field. Oh, okay. That's, I'm looking forward to that, yeah. seeing some of the guys yeah. that uh, – uh, it's, it's, it's great that the Mets are doing yeah. it. I know Mr. Cohn is yeah, he's at back is, uh, 100%, which is great. really <laughs> in, into the history of the team and and uh, and look for great things right. from the Mets right. this year and hopefully we'll Thanks keep our fingers time, crossed. My pleasure, Jay. Hey.